Okay, so first of all, I want to make two important announcements. The first one is that uh, assignment one has been uploaded. How many of you have checked Canvas or Carmen? Right, so you will see that assignment one would be uploaded there. So you take a look at it. And the second important thing is you need to, uh, the project is one of the very important component of this particular course. It's 40% of your final grade. Uh, and in the project, what I expect you to do is either you survey results from three papers and write your own six page report on it. So that's one option. The second option is you implement one algorithm in MATLAB or Python or R, whatever is your favorite programming language. And then, uh, and then we, uh, and then write a report on basically the implementation and what you found as a result of that implementation. Is that is that clear? Any questions on that? Uh, there are multiple stages of the project. On September 11th, you have to finalize the project topic and write a small abstract. Probably, uh, oh, I might have it here. Oh, choose the project topic and references to read. So you don't have to write an abstract, but you have to figure out what the project topic is and uh, and come up with three references if you are surveying papers and or uh, one algorithm that you would want to implement uh, so you can post it on canvas the on october 6th you have to submit an executive summary which is one page and then on november 10th you have to submit the project draft and i'll give you feedback on your project draft and then on december 6th you have the final project due um, so there are various stages and I expect you to uh, work on those stages and uh, the, bet the earlier you start the better it is for you okay uh, last days are usually bad so today I want to start focusing on optimization so last lecture was all about prerequisite so everyone is clear with the prerequisite so today we will talk about unconstrained optimization Okay, and in order to define the optimization problem, uh, we need to have a function f, which is defined from R n to R, and I'm going to assume that this function is smooth. Okay, you can do optimization with non-smooth function as well, but uh, for the purpose of this entire class, uh, we are going to assume that we have a smooth function it should at least be twice differentiable if not infinite differentiable uh, and what we want to solve so question is solve this problem of minimum x in rn f of x okay so we want to find the optimal point x star so x star is known as the optimal point or optimal solution And then you have the optimal value, which is f of x star. Okay. So it's not. It's for a general smooth function, which could be nonlinear and which could have multiple minimum or local minimums it's very difficult to solve uh, this this problem so but there are some cases where you can solve it so we will identify all those cases uh, in as the lecture progresses okay uh, so i want to define two things first is global minimum so X star is global minimum of F if and only if F of X star is less than or equal to F of X for all X in Rn. Okay, so that's the definition of global minimum and the second definition I want to introduce is local minimum 
So x star is a local minimum of f if and only if there exists an open neighborhood u <coughs> containing x such that f of containing x star such that f of x star is less than or equal to f of x for all x in mm -hmm. have a picture by the way you can define global maximum and local maximum also in an analogous manner so I have a function which looks Look something like this. Okay. So what is this? This point is my local maximum. This point is the local minimum this point this global maximum this point minimum this entire point is also a local minimum and this is minimum and these two points are local maximum So why would this be, so okay, I'll give you guys some time to write and then we'll discuss it again. Yeah. So why, why do you have to be open? Why does, okay. Because a closed neighborhood is a point itself. I mean, if it is a closed set, then it's a point itself. That's a closed set. Okay. So, why is this point? So, let's consider this particular point. Why is this a local minimum? So this is my star. So, if I so this is not a global minimum that you can see by inspection because because f of because there is an x star or a, some other x in rn such that f of x star is greater than f of x therefore it's not a global so this point is not a global minimum because there is other point that takes a value which is less than the value of the function at x star but it is a local minimum why is that so let's consider an open neighborhood around x star and as you can see, okay, the value of function in this neighborhood is always greater than or equal to the value of function at x star. Okay, so it's a so x star is a is a local minimum here. Okay, and this is a global minimum because the entire function lies above this point. Right, so that's the global minimum, and there is a strict minimum. strict local minimum in which you will say that f of x star is strictly less than f of x for all x in u 
x not equal to x star. Okay, that would be called a strict local minimum. Open neighborhood, okay. Uh, so consider an interval AB, AB, okay. So in this, the endpoints are not included, right? In this set, the endpoints are included. So this is an open set. Why is it an open set? Because the boundaries are not included, okay, in the set itself. This is a closed set because the boundaries are included in the set itself. Okay? So in fact, the reason why we need an open neighborhood, so the, there is, what's the benefit of having an open neighborhood? So if I pick any point in the open neighborhood, uh, in the open set, there is always a room for another open set within the larger open set. Okay? So, if this is your open set and I pick any point here, I can have an open set around that point, which is, li which is lying in entirely within this original open set. But that's not true for closed set. Why? Let's consider the closed set 1, 1. What is, it? What is this closed set? It's just a point on the real line. right? So if I pick a point within this point, which is just 1, there is no open set that contains that is contained within the entire set itself. Okay, that's why we want to have an open neighborhood here and not a closed neighborhood. Is that clear? Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is necessary conditions for optimality. Okay, and the first theorem that we will prove is that if x star is a local minimum of f, then gradient of fx star is equal to 0, and the second derivative of the function at x star is greater than or equal to 0. So this is known as the first order necessary condition. This is known as the second order necessary condition. So what is the underlying hypothesis here? The underlying hypothesis is that you have identified a local minimum of the function already. Okay? And what you want to come up, what you want to find out is what condition should this x star, which is a local minimum that you have identified, what, what, what condition should it satisfy? So it turns out that if it is a local minimum, then it has to satisfy these two conditions. Okay? There's no way it cannot satisfy those two conditions. So if I come up and say, well, I want to minimize x square, and I'm claiming that 1 is a local minimum of x, x square, uh, you can come up and say, well, it doesn't satisfy the necessary condition, so it cannot be a local minimum. Okay? So it gives you a certificate of, if someone is wrong, you can easily tell him that he's wrong, he or she is wrong. 
Okay, so let's see how we can prove this result. So by definition, f of x star plus alpha d for d in Rn, alpha greater than 0, fx star plus alpha d is minus f of x star is greater than or equal to 0. Okay, this is just the definition of uh, local minimum. So what I'm going to do is divide by alpha, both the sides. Okay, and now I'm going to take limit of alpha going to zero. Okay, so alpha is a positive number, so I'm going to decrease alpha all the way to zero. What is this limit? It, it is called some, it has a name. What is the name of this limit? Someone remember? Or? Derivative. But what derivative? Directional derivative. Okay, this is known as directional derivative. And it is equal to gradient of f at x star transpose d is greater than or equal to 0. Right? So this, this comes from this comes from a calculus, uh, I don't know, multivariable calculus. So we did Taylor series. So you can also prove this result from Taylor series. How many of you want to prove this result from Taylor series expansion? So it's clear to everyone? Nobody wants to see the proof using Taylor series? Okay. <laughs> Okay, let me just uh, what does Taylor series tells us? F x star plus alpha d is f of x star Okay, so now if I uh, get the expression, I have limit alpha going to zero, f of x star plus alpha d minus f of x star over alpha equals limit alpha goes to zero. Okay, so this term is independent of alpha, but this one depends on alpha, this one depends on alpha. This term is zero, this term is zero. So this is known as directional derivative. Now the key thing to note here is that this expression, gradient of fx star transpose d has to be greater than or equal to 0 for all d in Rn. So what we have is
What does that mean? It means that gradient of fx star transpose minus t is also greater than or equal to 0. So when is a scalar both positive and negative? Right? So this is a scalar. And this scalar is positive, I mean non-negative. And this scalar is also non-positive. What does that mean? The scalar is equal to 0. OK? And because this holds for all d in Rn, it means that gradient of f at x star must necessarily be 0. Because you can take d to be unit vectors along all directions. And what you will get is gradient of f of x star should be equal to 0. OK? So that's the first order necessary condition. What it says is that if x star is local minimum, then the gradient of function at that point has to vanish. OK? So now let's, uh, any questions so far? OK. So now the second, let's try to prove the second condition, which is a necessary condition, which is the second derivative of the function has to be a positive semi-definite matrix. So I'm going to go back to this. So I have f of x star plus alpha d minus f of x star over alpha square. What is it equal to? 1 over 2 d transpose gradient of fx star d plus small o of alpha square over alpha square. OK? Where I use the fact that the gradient of f at x star is equal to 0. So I can just drop this term of the Taylor series. I just have to keep this term. And alpha square goes here. OK, so that's what I have. And I know that this has to be greater than equal to 0, because x star is a local minimum. OK, so I can again take limit alpha decreases to 0. What happens to this term? Right? So as you take limit alpha going to 0, this term goes to 0. OK? And what I have is half d transpose gradient of f x star d is greater than or equal to 0 for all d in Rn. Questions? <coughs> Converse? Yeah. We'll get to it in a minute. Okay? So this is known as necessary conditions. Okay? What does this imply? Okay? So for any positive semi definite matrix, d transpose a d greater than or equal to 0 for all d in Rn is the same as saying a is a positive semi-definite matrix. Okay, So this is a fairly well-known result in linear algebra. So what that implies is, oh, this has to be second derivative. OK, the class is sleeping. OK, this is, this is second derivative here. Did I put second derivative here? Yeah. So what we have is the second derivative of function is greater than or equal to 0. Any question? No. So let's now talk about sufficient conditions for optimality.
Okay. So now the story has changed. Earlier the story was that if x star is optimal, is local minimum, then it has to satisfy some conditions. Now the story is, if a point satisfied the first derivative condition which is gradient of f at x bar is equal to 0 and the second derivative condition which is the gradient second derivative of f at x bar has to be strictly positive definite okay so this is not positive semi definite this is positive definite so if this holds true then x bar is a local minimum so we are not assuming the optimality of x bar here that's the conclusion okay so that's the difference between necessary condition and sufficient condition So what exactly do I have to prove here? What do I need to prove? Who can help me? So think about what we need to prove. I have to prove that fx minus fx bar is greater than or equal to 0. Yeah. Who said that? Okay. Let me rewrite it. You are right. Let me rewrite it. I have to prove that f of x bar plus alpha d minus f of x bar is greater than 0 for some alpha greater than 0 and d in Rn. Actually, I shouldn't say for some alpha greater than 0. Uh, not for some. I want to prove the local, local minimum part, right? So it has to uh, be true for, for a neighborhood of x, x bar, OK? So it has to be true for, for any direction around x bar. So this is my x bar. It doesn't matter whether I go in this direction or in this direction. It has to be true along all these directions. Okay, so that's what we need to prove. So let me again uh, pull uh, another trick from linear algebra, which is about positive definite matrices. Okay, so I'm going to keep recalling things from linear algebra as and when is needed. So if A is positive definite, then there exists lambda greater than zero such that A minus lambda I is also positive definite. Okay, so in, in, the, in the case of diagonal matrices, it's very easy to see. Uh, to give you an example, can someone tell me a diagonal matrix, positive definite diagonal matrix? I, I no, I don't want to take I because then lambda equals whatever, very uh, trivial. So let's take 0 0.0. 0 0.2. Okay, this is a positive definite matrix. I'm going to paint lambda equals 0 0.2 over 2. So 0 0.2 is the smallest eigenvalue. So I'm going to pick something which is half of that, 0 0.1. So 0 0.1 is strictly positive. And what is A minus lambda? It is 0 0.4, 0, 0, 0 0.1. This is also positive definite. Okay, but this, this holds true for all positive definite matrices. Okay, not necessarily diagonal. So, so, so the thing is, I know the first derivative is 0, I know the second derivative is strictly positive definite. 
And I, th I know this result from linear algebra. So how can we use it in Taylor series to arrive at the result? Okay, so okay. So I know that from linear algebra. So I have alpha d equals f of x bar plus gradient of okay and I'm taking d in Rn so d is any So if A is if A is a strictly positive definite matrix, then there exists a positive number such that A minus lambda, that positive number multiplied by the identity, is also a positive definite matrix. Okay, and this is an example of that. There exists one positive number. You can have multiple positive numbers, but at least one exists. Okay. So we have this expression as the Taylor series expansion of f of x bar plus alpha d. So what happens to this term? Zero. It's zero because by assumption, gradient of f at x bar is equal to zero. So what I have is f of x bar plus alpha d minus f of x bar is equal to one over alpha square d transpose I want to okay let me write it as 1 over 2 which is strictly greater than alpha square half lambda norm of d square So what did we do from here to here? Right, we just replaced the second derivative of f with lambda i. Okay, and we know that second derivative of f minus lambda i is just positive definite. So what does this mean? D transpose fx bar d is greater than lambda norm of d square. Okay, that's what it means. So we use that result here. Okay. So is this is this a non-negative number? Remember, this is what we want to prove. This is what we want to prove. So what we have to prove is this number, whatever this number is, is greater than or equal to zero. And so my question is, how can we prove that this is greater than or equal to zero? Guesses. 
Sorry? Okay, so this is a positive number. This is a positive number. What about this? It could be negative. That's right. So this term, this term does not depend on alpha at all. Whereas this term depends on alpha, right? And this term goes to zero as alpha goes to zero, right? So limit alpha goes to zero small o of alpha square over alpha square is equal to zero, right? So what it means is this term is strictly positive and this term is going to zero as I make alpha smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So there exists some small value of alpha for which this term is going to dominate this term, right? So this term is going to be much smaller. So even if it is negative, I don't care because this term is strictly is much, much larger than this term for small values of alpha. So it is greater than or equal to 0 for small values of alpha. Okay? Because this term dominates. This term dominates the other term. So even if this is negative, I don't care because for small values of alpha, this is negligible. This is very small. But this is very large. I mean, substantially larger than this. Okay, so that proves the result that f of x bar plus alpha d minus f of x bar is strictly positive. So what we prove is not only it's a local minimum, but it's a strict local minimum. Okay? Is a Strict. So strict local minimum because no matter in which direction you go, your cost always increases. <clears throat> okay? Any questions on that? So let's do an example. And it's an important example Okay, I have two examples. One is I want to minimize x cube x in R, and the second example is I want to minimize x square such that x is in R. So I am claiming that x star equal to 0 is an optimal solution to this problem. Okay. How will you go ahead and argue that I am wrong. It satisfies necessary condition. So what is gradient of f at x star? 0. What is the second derivative? That's also 0. Right? So it satisfies the necessary conditions for optimality. Yeah. Yeah, it's not great. Yeah, but it satisfies the necessary conditions for optimality. Right? Remember, the necessary condition was that the first derivative has to vanish, second derivative has to be greater than or equal to 0. Right? In this case, it's equal to 0. So where am I going wrong? Why is this not satisfying the necessary conditions? Remember what the hypothesis of that theorem was. If, no, not open neighborhood. If x star is optimal, right? So it doesn't satisfy the hypothesis. Therefore, no matter if it satisfies the derivative or not, it doesn't mean much, right? Because it doesn't satisfy, x star is not, x star equal to zero is not an optimal, is not a local minimum. 
right? The graph looks something like this. So it's not it's not a local minimum at all. So that's the that's the problem. Necessary conditions don't guarantee anything. Okay, if your X star is not locally optimal, it doesn't guarantee anything. So that's uh, that's the learning number one, outcome number one. In this case, I am claiming that X bar equal to zero is optimal. So let's check what is gradient of F at x bar, that's equal to 0. Second derivative of x bar is equal to 2, so it's strictly greater than 0. Therefore, x bar is a strictly local minimum. So x bar <coughs> is a strict local minimum. Okay. So, so I want you to keep this picture in mind for parsing through necessary and sufficient conditions. This is the Venn diagram. So this is a set of points satisfying the necessary condition. This is set of optimal solutions. And this is set of points satisfying sufficient conditions. Okay, it's extremely important that you remember this Venn diagram throughout the course. Okay, so what happens in the first example? I have a point here, but not a point here. Right, I have a point here, a, set, a point that satisfies necessary condition, right, but I have no points in the set of optimal solution. In fact, this doesn't even have an optimal solution, right? Whereas in this case, there is one point that lies inside this, so it is the set of optimal points, right? So the set of points that satisfy sufficient condition definitely are optimal solutions, but there could be points that do not satisfy sufficient conditions, but they are still optimal. And to give you an example for that, consider this function which looks like this. Okay, so the first derivative is zero, second derivative is also zero, right? So it satisfies necessary condition for optimality and x star is also equal to zero. So there is an optimal point here, but it just doesn't lie in this, in this block. It doesn't lie in the sufficient condition block. So there are examples where a point lies here, but not here, a point lies here, but not here, and a point that lies here. Okay, so all three examples are on the board. Any question? Yeah. So, I guess the inherent uh, factor here is that, like we already, already know from the beginning that the point is a local minimum. So, how, how do you apply these conditions when you don't initially know what it's a local minimum? Yeah, that's one of the biggest problems that people are facing in today's world. In fact, in many of the machine learning algorithms, you don't even know whether you have conversed to a local minimum or not, right? But they tend to do well on most of the data sets, so they say, okay, fine, this is good. 
So they made Alexa, they made Google search and all that stuff just based on approximation. But they cannot prove that it is indeed a global minimum or a local minimum or not. Okay? So in practice, you may be happy not being in a local minimum just because it's just so difficult to compute the local minimum exactly. Okay? So you are happy with some approximation thereof of the original problem. Okay, so now I want to talk about what happens when the function f is convex. So, the theorem is f from Rn to R is convex. I'm assuming smoothness here by default. So f is a convex function, then if, then x star is global minimum if and only if gradient of f at x star is equal to 0. So that's a very strong statement, very, very strong statement, as you would have seen by now. So the first derivative vanishing is both necessary and sufficient in case the function is convex. Okay. How do we go about proving it? So there are two statements hidden here, right? The first is if x star is optimal or is global minimum then gradient of f at x star is equal to 0. And the second hypothesis is if gradient of f x star is equal to 0, then x star is global minimum. So that's number 1, number 2. OK, so what I'm saying is this statement has two hidden statements. The first statement is this. If x star is global minimum, then the first derivative is equal to 0. And the second statement is if the first derivative is equal to 0, then x star is the global minimum. Do we need to s prove the first part? <coughs> Do we need to prove the first part? No, right? Because it follows from the first order necessary condition. Right? So all we need to prove is the second part that if the first derivative vanishes at a point, then it is a global minimum. So let's prove that in one line. f of x star plus alpha d is greater than or equal to f of x star plus alpha gradient of f x star transpose d. Remember, this was one of the definitions of convex function, right? A convex function satisfies this condition. So from previous class, so this is from previous class. Okay? So I know that the gradient of fx star is equal to 0. So this is 0. So what I have is f of x star plus alpha d is greater than or equal to f of x star. It's a global minimum. No matter which direction you go, no matter what the value of alpha you choose, that property holds. It's a global minimum. Okay. So now we get to, so this, this is end of theoretical part. Okay, now we get to the real algorithms. Any questions so far on this part? Okay, so that's why people love convex functions. People love minimizing convex problems because they know that if they converge, it's going to be a global minimum. 
they don't have to worry about locality of the minimum. Okay. So I want to introduce the first first set of algorithms for solving those class of problems which are known as gradient method. Okay. And the idea is as follows. I'm given a function f from Rn to R. And I pick x0 arbitrarily. Okay. So I'll ask someone, give me an x0. Come up with a random x0 or whatever. And I'll start. That's my initial point. I want to, so the question is, uh, come up with or define, devise, an algorithm to find gk such that k plus 1 equals xk plus alpha k dk. You know, you define this recursion, xk converges to x star. OK, that's my, that's my goal. Okay, so in the next five or six lectures, we'll just be doing this. Okay, so I, we don't have much time, so I don't want to uh, start a new topic now, but this is our goal, okay? This is our goal. For the next few lectures, we'll just be coming up or we'll be considering a specific function. We'll pick x0 arbitrarily and we'll try to find dk and alpha k in such a manner that we converge to the optimal solution or a locally optimal solution as k goes to infinity. Okay? If you have any questions, let me know. I have more course information sheets here, so if you uh, if you haven't found it, uh, if you haven't got it, please let me know and I'll give you one of these. Yeah. Have you uploaded your lecture videos yet? Yes. It's on YouTube but not on Canvas. I'll do it today. How do I find it on YouTube? I will, I'll upload it on, on Carmen today.